Okay, this is question and answer weekend. Instead of preaching a sermon, I'm going to be answering questions. This is live Q&A, which means for the most part, I'll be answering questions that are brought up to you. But I also got some questions that were emailed to me, and I'm not going to be able to answer all of them because I got uh, several of them, and it would have added up to a whole bunch. But I'm going to take one from the, each of the ones that were emailed into me and answer them. A couple of uh, things let me just uh, say ahead of time. Number one, um, the purpose of this is to understand that there's, no, there's nothing wrong with us asking questions. There's nothing wrong with us having questions. And the foundation of the answers that we want to give always should come from Scriptures. And so uh, sometimes they ask a, a particular question about a, a verse of Bible or something like that. I'll explain it. Uh, otherwise, sometimes they're asked questions about moral issues or social issues. I'll always, and as Christians, we always want to come back to what the Bible has to say. And then finally, uh, uh, some of the things that we talk about are things in which there are different understandings. Different Christian groups have different perspectives on different things, and I'll always give you my opinion, but if it's something that I'll say, you know, I'm not too sure about or something like that, I'll try and be honest with you in that way. Uh, My approach in this is not primarily theological. Uh, In in other words, I'm not trying to to answer it in a theological framework. My approach in this is, is primarily pastoral. And I'm answering it in terms of people whose lives are impacted by these questions. And I'll always take it in that kind of a direction. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And then we'll move along. Uh, uh, I'll go through these first questions. And then we have some other questions. There's uh, questions that you can send up. There's email if you want to send in. And then let's take a little bit of time to do this. But before we do that, let's pray together. Let's just look to the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you that you created us to be thinking that you created us to question, that you created us to try and learn and to understand. And this is a part of our process. We always want to learn from your word, and we always want to make our decisions based on what your Bible says. But we also understand, Lord, that sometimes there are things that are not directly specified in the Bible, and we have to try and figure them out. And many of the things that we're going to look at today, Lord, are ways that we try and understand what you want to say to us. And help us in these things, Lord. And my prayer is, Father, that everyone who is here would their understanding of you and their confidence in you would be strengthened as they realize that you are a God who loves us, who's not afraid of us asking questions, and that we can always turn to you in every situation of our lives. Thank you and praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Um, uh, William, you're going to want to get ready Psalm 103 and uh, the passage in Exodus as well. Uh, This is an interesting question. I want to take this... um, uh, one out of a series of questions I got. Uh, this question says, the wrathful Old Testament God is completely different from the peaceful New Testament God. If God's nature is unchanging, what accounts for these differences? Actually, there is no difference. Uh, there's a perception on many people's idea that the Old Testament, the God in the Old Testament is, is very angry and very uh, unjust and, and very critical and wrathful and, 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 at people. And this usually has to do with the nature of the warfare between the Israelites and the people who are around them. I watched a really interesting thing that, that was produced by people who are military strategists and historians, and they looked at the Israelites when they went into Cana and they fought certain groups of people. And one of the things it talked about was that the Israelites often destroyed their enemies. And it said that in a battle where you're fighting a battle and moving on, you always need to completely defeat your enemies before you move on because you can't allow your enemies uh, to fight from behind you. So it said from a military point of view, the behavior that some people don't understand was quite understandable. But what we really see if we look at the Old Testament, for instance, is we don't see God revealed in that way at all. For instance, is Exodus chapter 20, uh, and, and we'll work our way through this as we read through verses 1 through 11. Let's throw it up on the screen for everybody. And this is what it says. And, and the Lord spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. This is what we call the Ten Commandments, by the way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Okay, nothing wrathful there. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or earth, the earth beneath or in the waters below. Okay? You shall not bow down to them or worship them. The I, Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, jealous means that he wants all of our worship. That's not a wrathful issue. It's an issue of how much he loves us. Now, listen what it says here. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, think about that for a minute. God says, if you hate him, your behavior will impact the lives of your family 
for three or four generations. But if you love him for a thousand generations, he will bless you. Now, you say, well, God is very wrathful and very angry. Oh, really? Punishment for three generations, blessing for a thousand generations? Uh, that's not that, you know, that, that's, that's pretty lumsided on the gray side. But notice one more thing in there. He said, of those who hate me, but if you love me. So those people who hate God, they receive the punishment that comes from hating God, but all they need to do is to turn and love God, and they move to the other side. So what God is actually saying is, if you will obey me and if you will follow me, I will bestow my love on you. I will be great, uh, gracious to you, all of these things. Throw the one up for Psalm. Do we have the one from Psalm? What I'm trying to say, and, and, I, and I, okay, let's look through this. This is Psalm uh, 103. Okay, praise the Lord, O my soul, in my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, forgives your sins, heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, satisfies your desire with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow in anger, abounding in love. He will not accuse nor he will harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our transgressions from us. A father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He knows how we were formed. He remembers that we are dust. The, the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field. In other words, God is gracious and loving and kind and forgiving. These are all Old Testament descriptions. So it's inaccurate to say that God is revealed as being wrathful and angry in the Old Testament. And in fact, it's somewhat inaccurate to say that he's revealed in the New Testament as being only gracious and loving. What were the things Jesus said to, to the people who are against him? He drove them out of the temple with a whip. He said that my house is supposed to be a place of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. He called the Pharisees what? He called them whitewashed tombs, looking good on the outside, but full of death and corruption on the inside. What we find and what Jesus tells us is that when we've seen him, we've seen the Father. And what we find is a God of righteousness and holiness who asks his people to be righteous and holy. In fact, demands of his people to be righteous and holy. And yet he forgives them when they fail. He makes a way for them to be forgiven. He bestows good things on them. One of the verses that people quote often is a verse that says, it rains both on the just and the unjust. And they, and they see that as kind of, you know, in our modern way, we think of rain as being bad. But this is a desert land where the Scripture is given, and rain is a blessing from God. And God even brings blessings into the life of people who are unjust and evil. Yet still, God provides for them what some people might refer to as common grace. And so for us to think that way of God is actually, uh, we're too influenced by what some people say rather than being influenced by what we actually read. Okay, I'll move on to, a, there, there's some other great questions there, but I'm, I'm going to move back to some of them a little bit later if I have a chance. Uh, here's some other questions. Um, uh, Pastor Dave, uh, what? Let's see. I'll, I'll take the middle one, Pastor Dave. What are your thoughts on living together before marriage and sex before marriage? Uh, there's another question in here that has to do with uh, uh, people that are dealing with same sex same sex attraction issues about gay and lesbian marriage. So let me uh, reiterate and, and 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 put this all together for everybody. Really, really careful. The Bible teaches us that sex was invented by God. Okay, most human beings think they discovered it. But sex was invented by God. That's a joke, by the way. You're all, you're, I know you're all nervous as soon as I start talking about sex, but you're allowed to laugh, okay? So sex is invented by God, and God's purpose for sex is for a man and a woman who are married to each other to be, it's, it's like the driving force which allows them, as the Scripture says, the two become one. Now, that's not only a reference to sex. It's also a reference to emotionally, spiritually, uh, even intellectually, in, in every way, these two people become so much close together. And sex is designed by God to only function in that environment. And what happens is, is that when sex is used for anything else outside of it, it's wrong. 
Now, it's wrong if it's sex before marriage. It's wrong if it's sex outside of marriage. It's wrong if it's a sex with a person of the same gender. It's wrong if a person is involved in their, their, their sex life is all about themselves, uh, people who are having sex essentially with themselves. These are all things that are inappropriate. They're wrong. They're sinful because they're not what God planned for sex to happen. God had a plan and purpose for sex. Marriage is not about Mar- Let me see if I can say this correctly. Marriage is not about sex. Sex is about marriage. Marriage exists for, as God's purpose to, to have families, but it exists more than that. It exists for a man and a woman to become together in a relationship that eventually, we're told in the Bible, teaches us something about the very nature of God's love for, for us. And when we use sex outside of that, it's wrong. And it's not wrong because God is old-fashioned or God doesn't get it or somehow he's not modern enough. He knows what he invented it for. And every time we use it inappropriately, we are doing something wrong and we are cheating ourselves and, and we may be cheating other people as well. And so uh, that's my answer to that question. Uh, here we go. Uh, 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 Father Dave, I like that. I answer to that. Uh, Father Dave, I, I have a question I want to ask. I've been married for a long time. And my husband behaves really badly. He's always on Facebook flirting with other girls. I've also found him going to porn sites, but when I ask him, he becomes angry and he uses bad words on me and he says I'm just jealous. If a guy is going on porn sites, of course his wife is jealous and she should be jealous. That's a terrible thing. Um, Let me say this, by the way. Um, Something that's come up to me quite a bit in a number of different situations in the last few years is this concept that, that uh, within a marriage, within a husband and a wife, there's, a, there's a, a certain degree of privacy. Like a wife should never look at her husband's phone and a husband should never look at his wife's phone. I don't know where that idea comes from, but I think that's absurd. Uh, the only reason that we would insist on privacy, you, know, you can't look at my phone, is because we would be saying things that we don't want our spouse to hear. And why would we think that's a good thing? Uh, uh, you know, there's nothing in the book of Leviticus that says uh, what's on your computer screen is a secret between only you and yourself. Uh, Let me tell you, let me warn you that whatever's on your computer screen, God certainly knows. And I promise you whatever's on your computer screen, the National Security Agency of the U.S. government probably knows. And you know, why, why do you think that you would have this, this, this overwhelming right to privacy? The Bible says two become one. Now, where in that one does one have a separate part of their life that they cut out and, and the other person has no access to it? So uh, there's a problem in this particular relationship. Uh, he, says, uh, he says, I should just be happy because he comes home and all he does is look at his phone. Uh, he doesn't want me to be, spend any time with me. He's only busy with his friends, and he goes on trips, but he doesn't bring me along. I don't know what he does. I only go to his office once a year. Sometimes he won't speak to me for days. I don't know what to do. He won't tell me where he's going, but he's going with other girls. Um, this, is a, this is a marriage that's in a lot of trouble. And I think anybody here, no matter what you might think about your own personal life, anybody here would recognize that this marriage is in trouble. And it's the reason it's in trouble, let, let's, let's assume, let's just say assume for the sake of argument that this person, the man in this marriage, is not doing anything wrong, okay? Let's just assume that when he's talking with people on Facebook, he's testifying about Jesus to everybody he talks to on Facebook. And, and let's assume that the reason he doesn't want his wife to go to his office is because he's sharing the gospel in his office. And you know, let's assume every possible thing that we can Okay, when he's on his mobile phone, he's sharing gospel versions with other people. Okay, Even if he hasn't done anything wrong, there's a problem. Because this doesn't sound like two people becoming one. This sounds like the exact opposite. Two people moving in opposite directions. Folks, that's not what God's intention for marriage is. Now, please don't misunderstand. Every marriage is complicated and every, every marriage is difficult. When two people get married, they, they try and bring completely separate lives together. And this requires a lot of us to learn to grow in grace and learn to grow in forgiveness and exercise all these things. But that's the essence of becoming mature as followers of Jesus Christ. If this is your email to me, you need help. And so you need to, you need to contact me and I will try and help you. Uh, I don't know what can be done to help your marriage, but there are 
always things that can be done to help every marriage. Every marriage can be helped. Not every marriage can be saved, but every marriage can be helped. And if only one person in a marriage wants to make the marriage better, it can still become better. If both people in a marriage want to make a marriage better, then the marriage has a really, really good possibility of moving forward. Okay, uh, uh, we're going to go forward. And we got tons of questions. Okay, we're going to go now. Uh, here we go. If the answer to bribery, as you explained in the first service, is to do what you feel comfortable then, would it be all okay to break the law as, as long as we're comfortable with it? Ah, uh, that's not, if I said what we're comfortable with, I, I spoke wrong. The issue is this. In the first service, I was asked about bribery. And what I said is, I'm not here to be the police for you. I have to deal with bribery. And the Bible clearly says that bribery is wrong. I have to deal with it in my context, and usually what's comfortable is the wrong thing, not the right thing. I, mean, I don't know about your experience, but usually we want to do what we know we're not supposed to do. I'm not saying you get to do whatever you want. I'm not saying you get to take the easy way. I'm saying that as a person who believes you should follow God, it's very clear that bribery is wrong. Now, what I also said is not every circumstance where you are giving somebody something is bribery. For instance, the example that was given in the question this morning is, you know, the example in brackets of tipping. If I go to a restaurant and I get good service, am I, am I bribing them by tipping them? If I go to a restaurant and I'm coming back the next week, do I, am I bribing them because I'm giving them a, a, a money so that the next time I come, I'll get better service? I, I don't, I think you have to be really careful. Uh, there are different laws that relate to this, and there are different standards that different governments have. I think, in my opinion, there's a clear difference between extortion and bribery. Uh, one way that extortion is explained is uh, if somebody, if I'm entitled to something and they won't give it to me unless I give them money, I think that's extortion and it's not bribery. And I am not, I, I should say, I'm never comfortable with the, with the exercise of these things, but I understand that. But my point is, is I'm not, here, I'm not here for you to tell me what you do and then I say it's right or wrong. What I want you to do is know what the Word of God says, that bribery is bad for you. It's bad for your family. It's bad for people. It's bad for a country. And then I want you to look at your life and say, God, what do I do in all of these situations? Now, I, 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 do, have, uh, I, I do have a number of people who have told me that they've, some of them have done business in Indonesia for 30, 40 years, uh, Indonesians, and they have told me they have never bribed. So I know it's possible. But I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to ask you to judge yourself. So it's not about being comfortable. It's about knowing what the Word of God says, looking at your situation, and resolving what you think God wants you to do, and then doing what He wants you to do. So great question. Thank you. I'm glad I had a chance to share that. If my parents make big mistakes, how can I tell them without hurting their feelings? Wow. That's really, really difficult. What you need to do is you need to cultivate within your family an attitude of being able to speak openly. And then you need to find ways to be effective in talking to them. One of the things I would recommend in dealing with parents, maybe about some errors that parents have made, would be to find somebody else who can help you to talk to them. If you are answering this question and you're quite a bit younger, it may be very difficult for your parents to take correction, like say if you're 21 or 16 or even 30 and your parents are older, it may be very difficult for them to take correction from you. And so you may be able to find another family member who can help you by being the one who would approach them. And then it always helps if your, your, your approach is not condemning, but your approach, in fact, is, is, is trying to bring comfort and trying to be encouragement and maybe pointing them to the right direction. So if you're asking that question about a situation you're in, I'll certainly pray for you. But when you help anyone, including your parents, it's a good thing. And your purpose has to be to help them and show them that there's a better way. So great question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pastor Dave, regarding gender reassignment, what if changing gender gives peace of mind and makes a person closer to God? Okay, very, very good question. Gender reassignment, uh, we're going back to the issue of uh, uh, to the transgender issue. Uh, last week I talked a little bit about the situation of Caitlyn Jenner, who used to be referred to as Bruce Jenner, uh, now prefers to refer to uh, himself as a woman. I, I'm not going to debate if he wants to be called she instead of he. I'm not going to debate that. However, let me make sure that everybody understands this. Uh, when you have surgery and when you take, uh, for instance, a man who wants to do gender reassignment, when they have surgery and when they have, uh, take female hormones, they do not fundamentally change who they are. 
biologically, they are still, uh, no matter how intensive the surgery is, they are still the gender that they were born. Uh, you can have changed the appearance, but you do not fundamentally change who they are. Now, um, if a person, uh, the, the, the empirical evidence on the effectiveness of gender reassignment is up for debate. The, the present state of science seems to suggest that people who have gender reassignment, most of them or many of them do not feel that they did the wrong thing. But most of them do not, it does not result in a better life of happiness and things like that. So in other words, if people who want to have gender reassignment, there are people who have it and there are people who don't have it. And there is no empirical evidence that the people who actually have their gender reassignment are more psychologically healthy, uh, more uh, comfortable with themselves, and are living a happier life than the people who didn't have it. So you have to be honest about the science of the numbers. You can argue back and forth and so on and so forth. I, I, do, not, I do not believe that it's the right thing to do because I believe that we are supposed to function not as who we feel we are or not as who we think we are. We need to function as who God made us to be and see ourselves as not pursuing our own emotional fulfillment and our own happiness, but see ourselves pursuing exactly who God wants us to be. Now, I do not for a moment dispute that there are people who feel they were born the wrong gender. I don't dispute that. I also don't dispute that there are people who uh, struggle with same-sex attraction. I don't dispute there are people who are asexual in the sense that they have very little sex drive at all. I don't dispute any of those things. But what I'm trying to say is that our, our role in life is not to be who we think we are supposed to be. Our role in life is to be who God created us to be. I believe with all my heart that you and I and every other person on this earth, that God has a plan and purpose for their life, and our goal is to fulfill His plan and purpose for our life. And His plan and purpose is not about being happy and being satisfied with who we are. The selfish approach that I'm going to make myself happy, I'm going to be who I want to be, I'm going to stand up there and sing, I did it my way, that doesn't lead to happiness. Jesus said, if you try and save your life, you'll lose it. If you put your first yourself, you'll be first, you'll be last. But when you give up your life for following Jesus, that's where true peace and happiness comes from. And so it's not, there's not a surgery that's going to make you happier. Uh, let, let me give you another example. I, I'll just go completely all, all to the other end. Uh, you guys know about the surgery that they do in, uh, in China to make people taller? Did you know about that, how that works? You, 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 you do this thing where uh, it's, it's largely women who have the surgery because they want to be taller, they want to be models and stuff. You lie in bed and they, and they put clamps into your bones uh, uh, along your thigh, uh, through the skin, and they clamp the bone and then on a, a spot a little bit further, and then they saw your bone, cut your bone, and then they, they move the spaces of the clamps so that they're you know, just a fraction, like a quarter of an inch apart. And then the bone grows towards the bone. And then as it gets almost to start healing, then they move it further apart again. And they move it further apart again. And they move it further apart again. They can increase a person's height up to about four centimeters. Folks, that's ridiculous. Honestly, that's ridiculous. As if, as if I mean, I could have everybody stand. And when we could have everybody who's taller on this side and everybody who's taller on that side, we could do psychological tests and see if they're happier or not happier because of the height they are, you know. Uh, that has nothing to do with it. Any kind of thing like that that you think that those kinds of things are the things that are going to make you happy, what's going to make you happy is being the kind of person that God called you to be. He created you. He knows what you're created for. He has a plan and purpose in your life. And changing your body is not going to change that. Making yourself taller is not going to change that. Changing the superficial sexual characteristics that you have is not going to change that. So, great questions. Thank you. What's wrong with Catholic theology from the perspective of Protestantism? Many Protestants in Indonesia dislike Catholics. Why is that? Um, I, I, about one-third of the people that go to IES uh, have a Catholic background. And many of the people who go to IES still consider themselves Catholics. I want to, I want to answer this uh, so everybody understands me. I am, by my theology, a Protestant. 
Uh, because I was raised in the Philippines, and which is primarily a Catholic country, uh, my wife comes out from a family that uh, were very, very staunchly Catholic. I have a cousin who a, 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 has, a, 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 has a graduate degree in Catholic theology. Uh, my, I have a nephew who is a wonderful man of God who is, still considers himself to be a Catholic and is very much involved in, in uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, I understand a lot about Catholic theology. I am theologically a Protestant. I do not believe that Catholic theology is so wrong to say that anybody who's a Catholic is not a follower of Jesus. I don't believe that for a moment. However, the, the, the biggest difference is this, if you want to break it down into, uh, into things that are understandable. Catholic theology basically says that it is within the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, that God is working in the world today. And so, therefore, the Catholic, the Catholic theology says they acknowledge the presence of grace and other beliefs, but they believe that you are saved by being a part of the Catholic Church. And that, the, for instance, the Bible is, is, uh, is the Word of God because it is acknowledged by the Catholic Church. In Protestantism, we believe that God is dealing with the world today through the Word of God, and the Word of God is the test as to what God wants in our hearts and lives. And this is a fundamental issue under on the, the fundamental reason that the Protestant Reformation came about was the primacy of tradition or the primacy of Scripture. That's why the sola scriptura the statement of the, of the Reformers is such an important thing. So what I believe is that when I have a theological question, I look at what the Bible says, and that is the most important criteria and the, by far... In the Catholic tradition, they believe that the most important criteria is what the tradition of the church says. And that's the primary difference. However, Protestants and Catholics should not be fighting with each other, uh, neither in any place where that's going on. Uh, we need to understand that there are many different, within the, within the Roman Catholic Church, within the Eastern Orthodox churches, and within the different streams of the Protestant churches, all of them believe certain things that are important for us to have a relationship with God. And so we shouldn't be putting each other down. Where there are differences, let's learn to cope with those differences and understand those differences. I am clearly Protestant in my theology. I'm not only Protestant, I am Pentecostal in my theology. So my theology is substantially different from Catholic theology. I do not believe their theology is right, but I do not condemn anyone who follows the traditions of Catholicism. I want them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ like I have. You're not going to be saved because you're Catholic, but you're not going to be saved because you're Protestant. You're not going to be saved because you're Pentecostal. You're not going to be saved because you go to IES. You're going to be saved. You're going to be reconciled with God because you've asked God to forgive your sins through Jesus Christ. That's the critical issue, not the nomenclature you give to it. Thank you. Great question. Uh, how do I ask God if he, she is the one? You mean if God is the one or? Yeah, come on. You guys know I don't believe in soulmates, okay? I don't believe in soulmates. There is no single right person that you're supposed to marry and nobody else you're supposed to marry, okay? What you're supposed to do as a Christian who's looking for somebody to marry, number one, you're supposed to look for somebody who has, shares your faith. And let me say that you should, the more your faith is shared, the more chances that you are that you will have a marriage that will be successful and, and that you will be able to function with a lot of joy and, and things like that in your marriage. Because marriage, uh, religion is so important in your life together that if you don't share faith, it will not draw you together. It will actually draw you apart. Other than that, you need to find somebody who works, who's, who who life with them will be less stressful than it will be in other ways. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's like one person, if you miss that person, you're lost forever. Uh, you need to find somebody who shares as much as possible. I had that discussion with my wife. Somebody said something about, like, do you have to marry somebody who's compatible with you? I don't think my wife and I, we share faith. One of the first things that attracted to me about my wife was that she had, uh, she had a very successful career and uh, she, she stopped her career because she wanted to serve God. I knew that serving God was of utmost importance for her. But in other ways, we're not very compatible at all. But, but I think we have a good marriage, and we have a good marriage because we work at it. But uh, there is no one out there. So you need to look for people who, who you know, uh, share your faith 
and share the things that you, the values and things that you want to have in life. And those would be the important things. Okay. Uh, Pastor Dave, I'm in a relationship with a person from another religion. What would your advice be because I'm in love with this person and before I make my decision to marry him or her? How, should mar- how about marrying someone who's a, diff- a good person but have a different religion? Wow. I kind of answered that question. This kind of goes through that. Let me, let me say this again so you understand. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ and then you get married to a person, what's supposed to happen in that marriage is that the two of you become one. And that is a reference to sexuality. That is a reference to uh, emotionally. That is a reference to a, a, a physically caring for each other. That is a reference to uh, intellectually. You learn to be more like each other. And that is a relationship. That is a reference to spiritually. Now, if two are going to become one and you don't share the same religion, that is going to be almost impossible to make it be very successful. Uh, somebody asked the question, I think it was earlier, is God going to punish you? No, God's not going to punish you. You're punishing yourself. You're making a decision that will cause you a great deal of hurt and a great deal of harm. And not only that, it will cause your spouse a great deal of hurt and a great deal of harm. Because because you're never going to be able to relate to them 100% in the way that they want you to. I, I've had people tell me, Pastor Dave, I'm very jealous because it seems like my wife or my husband loves Jesus more than they love me. I don't like that. I hope my wife always loves Jesus more than she loves me. I will always love Jesus more than I love her. Because of those loves for Jesus, it is Jesus who compels me to be a good husband even when I don't want to be a good husband. And believe me, there are lots of times I'm not a good husband. And there's lots of times I'm selfish, and there's lots of times I'm inconsiderate. But I can't can't settle for those things because the power of God and the Word of God compels me to love for my wife, to care for my wife, to be thankful for my wife, to, to do all those kinds of things. It's not about emotion, it's about action. And if your spouse doesn't share those things, you have no foundation for building a life together. You're going to hurt each other. And so, great question. Please don't misunderstand that. It's the right thing for you to do for yourself, and it's the right thing for you to do for your spouse, to marry a person who shares your faith. Uh, Next question. Are all sins equal? Yes and no. All sins are sin. The Bible says, God, when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. Sin is any action against God. However, the human consequences of sin are completely different. So, for instance, what if I got really angry with somebody? Let's say Goldman's there. Uh, what if I got really angry at you and I walked down and punched you? Or I walked down and choked you to death? Would they be equally sin? Yes, they would both be wrong in the eyes of God. Would the consequences of them be equal? No, of course not. That's very, very obvious. The problem for us is that we often judge sin based on the consequences rather than the offense against God, and we need to understand the difference between those things. But we should never never say, uh, oh, it's okay to sin because there's not so much consequence, or like a lot of people do, oh, it's okay to sin because nobody knows. God knows, and all sin is against him. Remember what David said in Psalm 51 after he committed adultery and murdered somebody and betrayed the nation of Israel? He said, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Because he realized the sins that he had committed in this world did not measure up against the sin he had committed against God. Great question. Sorry for using you there, Gorman. I, I promise not to hit you afterwards. So, okay. Uh, okay. Consciously, I know that I have a father issue. He's been failing me since I was a kid. He used to beat me up and kept going out with girls other than my mom behind my back. Now he's a sort of demanding his share as a father of the working children in terms of financial, and yet he keeps tricking us by lying. Is it okay to be mad and furious? I can't forgive him yet. Too painful. Um, uh, there's more? Is there more in that question? Okay. Um, it's not okay to be mad and furious, but it's understandable to be mad and furious. And this question describes a, a circumstance that is broken by sin. And unfortunately, it's a circumstance that's all too common. To be failed by your parents is one of the most profoundly hurtful things that can happen to a human being. To be failed by your father is is profoundly hurtful. And in this particular instance, the father continues the failing. 
and continues the abuse. Now, it's understandable that you're hurt and bitter and not yet ready to forgive. However, you need to remember and understand that what God wants is for you to be able to move beyond that. And part of that process is the process of forgiveness. There are many, many people who have been failed by parents or failed by other people who are close to them. And what needs to happen in a situation like that is we need to understand that part of what it takes for us to be healed is to accept what they have done and forgive them and not hold it against them. Now, that's very, very hard to do. Uh, um, you can get help to do that, and the Lord can help you, and counselors can help you, but you need to really understand that it's important. And, and, and the reason it's important is because unless you forgive them, you'll never be free from what they've done to you. They will control you for the rest of your life. The only way you can be set free is to begin to, to forgive. Now, you say, well, Pastor Dave, how on earth can I forgive something like this? This is important. The way you begin the process of forgiveness is you begin to act towards them in the same way that God acts towards you. When God forgives you, He treats you as if you had never sinned. He forgives it. He doesn't act on it anymore. And the way that you respond to that kind of behavior is the same way. You do not treat them according to the things that they have done. So if you have a father who has done those kinds of things, you learn to treat him with respect, even though he hasn't earned a respect through his actions. You still need to respect your father. Now, that doesn't mean you allow them to, to take advantage of you. That doesn't mean if you have a father, for instance, who's, who's dishonest, that you allow them to take your money and, and squander your money because you have a responsibility to be a good steward of what you have. But it does mean that you cannot simply be angry and harsh with them all the time and justify it in yourself. This is a really serious issue. And, and my request to whoever is in this particular situation is get good help from a Christian, from a pastor or a Christian counselor who can help you to work through these things. But the goal of this is to, is to find healing because you're wounded by this experience. And so that's the real goal here. Okay. Uh, this question and the next question is something like this. How do you give, forgive people who have hurt you badly and in your heart you still want to take revenge or desperately praying they will suffer the same? Okay, understand this. Number one, the Bible clearly tells us that, that God's attitude towards us in these issues is God says this, don't repay evil for evil, but he says, vengeance is mine. He is a God of justice. And anything that any time a person has hurt you, they will pay for that unless they are forgiven. Okay? So you don't need to, 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 to get even. Now, he uh, says you badly want in your heart to take revenge. Don't take revenge. Because if you take revenge on somebody who did something wrong by doing the same thing, you're just as wrong as them. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna allow them to destroy your life by their behavior. Don't do that. You are not responsible I have a saying that I say all the time, and I finally realized why people didn't understand it. I say, we're not supposed to be reactors, we're supposed to be actors. And then somebody said, why are you telling us to be actors? You don't want to be hypocrites. I don't mean being an actor like a hypocrite. I mean, we live our life based on what we know we're supposed to do, and we do it, not based on what somebody else has done to us. So when somebody hurts you, you cannot take revenge on them. Because in taking revenge, you're doing something wrong, and you, are, you have to answer to God for what you do. However, you can have confidence to know, uh, you know, be sure your sins will find you out according to the Scriptures. People who sow bad things will reap bad things. And you might even find that you won't be happy when it happens to them either. But the first step is for you to, to, to give up the thought of revenge and say, Father, you deal with them. I give up. I surrender the right to give revenge. And I know that's very, very hard. Some of you have been hurt very, very badly. Some people have been betrayed very, very, very badly. And when that happens, you need to turn to God and seek peace from Him. But we are not allowed to take revenge because God has forgiven us. We must forgive others. That's how we are like Him. Great question. Uh, how do we cast away black magic? Okay, if you've been involved in black magic or white magic or any other kind of occult thing, Number one, you need, to, you need to pray and ask God, renounce it, 
turn your back on it, have nothing else to do with it anymore, ask God to, to cleanse you and purify you from anything else like that. You need to get rid of every... Magic is almost all involved with spells, incantations, charms, uh, potions, uh, you know, different things like that. You need to get rid of all of that stuff. You need to get it as far away from you as you possibly can and don't ever go back to it. Separate yourself from that kind of behavior completely. Don't, 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 don't dabble in it. Don't try and get your fortune read. Don't worry about casting spells on other people. Don't and try and see if other people are casting spells on you. You need to separate yourself from it. Now let's, everybody bow your heads real quickly. Everybody bow your heads real quickly. I want to do this. Father, I believe that there are probably people who are in here right now who have been involved in things like black magic and white magic and spells and things like that. There may be people who are sitting right here now that have all kinds of occultic charms in their pocket or involve themselves in these kinds of things. I pray right now in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will break all of those demonic activities, that you will set every single person free. I pray that you would just take those things away. That if there's anybody here who is cursed in any way by any evil spirit or any evil activity, I pray that you would protect them, that you would break any curse, that you would break any bondage, and that you would set them free. And I pray further that anybody who's here who has any kind of a magic thing or magic uh, charm or anything else like that, Father, that you would allow them the, the, as soon as they are able as soon as this time is over, that they would go and they would get, get rid of those things and they would have nothing to do with those things anymore. When they go home, they would get rid of those things in their house. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're involved in those kinds of things, get rid of it. Okay? Don't have anything to do with it. What does the Bible say about prenuptial agreements in marriage? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I actually, I, I know a lot of people feel differently about me than this. I actually don't have a problem with a prenuptial agreement in a marriage. As long as people understand their prenuptial agreement has to do with assets and not to do with commitments, okay? So if the prenuptial agreement is once a year you can cheat on your wife, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. But, but uh, in, in Indonesia specifically, there are some legal reasons why it's not a bad idea for people to have prenuptial uh, agreements because there are some kinds of legal things about uh, personal responsibilities for bankruptcies and things like that, as well as issues of a person who's an Indonesian married to a foreigner. If the woman is an Indonesian and her husband is a foreigner, uh, he's not, they don't, if they don't have a prenuptial agreement, she can't own property, uh, things like that. So th there are some real reasons for that. However, the danger with prenuptial agreements is that people go into a marriage thinking, well, if it doesn't work out, it's okay. That is wrong. Everyone who goes into marriage should be totally committed to making the marriage work. However, to have a legal understanding, the basic premise of a prenuptial agreement is this. What belongs to the man belongs to the man. What belongs to the woman belongs to the woman. What belongs to them both belongs to them both. There's nothing unbiblical about that. It's just laying things out from a legal point of view. If the idea behind it is I don't trust you with my money, so I'm going to make this prenuptial. If, you don't trust, if, if you're, if you're going to marry somebody who doesn't trust you with their money, don't marry him. I'm sorry, you know. I mean, if that's, if that's the way they feel, then just find somebody else. I will promise you there is no one, but they're not it, yeah, if that's the way they are. Now, sometimes it has to do with businesses and all this kind of stuff, and I understand that, and we need to be realistic that um, that's not an unbiblical practice. Uh, so, uh, anyway, good. Uh, does God honor the death penalty as a law being implemented by government? I'm not, I'm not sure that the Bible tells us clearly one way or another on the death penalty as it relates to governments. Number one, I don't think that there's any government in the world that's godly. Any government, anywhere. I don't think there's any government in the world who, who judges and rules godly. I don't think there's any government in the world who, who would make a decision on the death penalty whether God was in favor of the death penalty or not. Number two, I believe that Christians can disagree on the death penalty and both be correct from the perspective that they have. So uh, it's complicated enough for people who are believers who have different opinions about the death penalty and so uh, to, to say that a government has to do it 
one way or another is very, very complicated. Number three, I, I have made a decision after a lot of thought about it and things like that, that I am against the death penalty. And the reason that I'm against the death penalty is not because I, have a, I, I, I believe that uh, the innocent life issue, uh, my, my issue is that everyone should have an opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus. And when you exercise, exer, uh, uh, execute somebody, you take that possibility away from them forever. And that's my compelling reason. I know the reasons uh, that people have against the death penalty. I understand a lot of those reasons. They make a lot of sense. I'm very sympathetic with that position. But I also know people who believe in a death penalty, and I understand their position, and I'm not going to condemn them and say that they're wrong as well. Um, it's a very, very complicated issue, and it's one in which, as Christians, we should be gracious. However, I, fam governments, I don't think are, governments aren't moral agents. Governments are collections of laws, and so I don't believe there is such a thing as a godly government. So the issue of morality of, of the death penalty uh, is a slightly different issue, complicated. Maybe it'd be worthwhile having a sermon on that sometime. Thank you. My husband, uh, can we back up? There was one I was going to, oh, never mind. Go to this one. Okay. What is the view of IES and what does the Bible say about such thing, uh, homosexuality, such as the issue of being born with it, gay marriage, such as the issue of people should have the freedom to express their love and get married to each other? Uh, marriage governed by the state, uh, issues of forcing marriage vendors not to reject what's being asked in gay weddings. How would you answer people who ask us why, as Christians, are we against a lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender lifestyles? Uh, are we still going? Uh, what about the genetics factor? How should we treat lay, uh, LGBT people? There's a rumor in the internet that the new NIV translation, Check My Bible apps as well, has got some missing verses. Okay, we got uh, one of them is about homosexuality. No, it's not. There's nothing about these so-called missing verses. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are interested in that issue, I do have uh, something that I posted on Facebook. I also have three copies of it that relates to the thing that's on the, Bible, uh, on the Internet and social media about the NIV taking things off. Uh, I'll have these three copies. You can come and get one afterwards. Okay, let's back up. Let me run my way through these, okay, from the beginning. Back up, back up, back up. Okay, what is the view of IES and what does the Bible say about homosexuality, such as the issue of being born with it? Okay, what the Bible says, what I said to you, is that sex, according to the Bible, is reserved for a man and a woman who are married to each other, which means that homosexual activity, sex, homosexual sex, is against the Word of God and against God's plan. So is premarital sex, so is extramarital sex, and so is, you know, any form of sexuality that does not involve a man and a woman who are married to each other. This is not an issue of God didn't really understand. God not only created us, He created us as sexual beings. He created us to use sex to create a bond between a man and a woman, and in that bond, this is fulfilling something that God wants of us. So, people who are not married to a person, of, 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 of a man who is not married to a woman, a woman who is not married to a man, are required by Scripture to live celibate lives. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't really matter whether they're born that way or not. In fact, you know, that's the famous song, I was born that way. The problem with that idea is that people can justify any kind of behavior by saying that they were born that way. And that is not actually what Scripture wants us to believe. I, people say, well, what if people are born that way? Doesn't it mean any kind of behavior is okay? What if people are born to be liars? Uh, is it okay for them to tell lies? What if people are born with a terrible temper and they like to beat other people? Is it okay for them to beat other people? Of, of course not. Behavior is not based on what we feel or what we want. It's based on a set of rules that God gives us in Scripture. Okay? So whether you're born that way has nothing to do with it. Next question is about gay marriage. So that's the issue of, oh no, stay back. That's the second question on that page. Stay, back up for me. Okay. Uh, gay marriage, such as the issue of people should be, have the freedom to express their love and get married to each other. People don't have the freedom to express their love. People don't have the freedom to express marriage. If you're married to one person, you, you, can't, you don't have the right to go fall in love with somebody else and express your love for that person because that's just the way you feel. That's not a restriction that the Bible applies to a limited group of people. That's a restriction that the Bible applies to every single human being. It's not about how you feel. It's about the rules and guidelines. Now, I hope and I believe that all of you would choose to be married to somebody that you would also have a great deal of love for, and that would be a wonderful thing. But if you can, if you can just do whatever you want, your marriage is never going to survive. Because I promise you, no matter how you feel about a person when you ask them to marry you, you're not going to feel that way every time. And like I said earlier in the beginning, men, God made us with a whole bunch of testosterone. 
And that drives our sex drive. And men can be sexually attracted to any number of things, people, male or female. That doesn't mean that they have the right to fulfill whatever it is they want. No. So we don't allow marriage, not because we want to keep people from being who they love, with who they love. People can love a whole lot of different people through their life. It's who they are committed to and have made a vow to that's the issue. Okay, uh, can we back up? Um, can we back up again from that? Okay, marriage governed by state. The issue of state forcing wedding vendors not to reject being asked to contribute to a gay wedding. In my opinion, if I, I can get in trouble with this, but let me just tell you. If I bike wedding cakes and I have a business to sell wedding cakes and somebody comes to me and says, uh, I would like you to bake a cake for my wedding and, and there, are, there are a couple of the same sex who are getting married uh, because of the, what the law says. If I'm operating a wedding cake business, I should bake them a cake. In fact, because I'm a Christian, I should bake them a really good cake. In fact, maybe the Bible says I should bake them two cakes. Yeah? Now, just because I don't, just because I don't, I don't agree with what they're doing, does that mean I don't bake them a cake? Right? So somebody comes to my, my office and I bake cakes and I say, uh, are you really committed that you will love your spouse completely all the rest of your life? No matter what happens, you'll never be unfaithful. you raise your kids in the church. No. Oh, I won't bake a cake for you. <laughs> or when people come into my, my shop and I bake cakes, I'm going to say, are you, are you followers of Jesus Christ? Do you go to church faithfully? No, I'm not going to bake a cake for you. I mean, if, if I'm endorsing something because I'm baking a cake for it, then I'm not going to have much business. Yeah. So I don't believe... I don't believe that people who are in a commercial business of providing wedding things have a right to turn down weddings. I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't know why as a Christian you would want to. Come on, can I, be honest with me. How many of you have gone to a wedding in the last three months? Raise your hand. Oh, come on, raise your hand. You guys are just sitting out there staring at me. How many of you went to the wedding, you looked at the wedding cake, and you said, man, that baker really appreciates them and supports their lives? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. Now, I respect those people who who didn't want to do it, and I'm not satisfied that they're being, you know, in a number of famous cases, they're being attacked. I think that as Christians, they just didn't think through what they were doing. I think they got bad leaders in their religious life. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, one more, one more, one more. Uh, how should we answer people who ask why is we are Christians are against gay, lesbian, uh, L LGBT lifestyle? We're against, we're not against people. We're against sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman because that's what the Bible tells us God did for us as human beings. And that's what we're against. We're not against anybody. Now you say, well, Pastor Dave, what about somebody who has a same-sex attraction? Then they get to live a life pleasing and honoring to God by being celibate or by sharing their life with a, with, with a person of the opposite sex who understands their struggle and commits to living life together and living in victory through that life. And that's a wonderful thing. God has a plan and purpose for their life, no matter what their feelings are, and they can fulfill God's plan and purpose in their life. You say, how is it possible that somebody could become more like Jesus by denying themselves and obeying God? Duh! That's the definition of becoming more like Jesus. You say, well, can't they just give in to their feelings? No, none of us can give in to our feelings. That's not what the essence of, what, 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 what's the scripture we looked at? You should have the same attitude as Christ Jesus who what? Didn't, dis, did, didn't understand that, that, that equality with God was something to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself, becoming a human and coming to the earth. The essence of being like Jesus is not to take, it's to give. It's to give up yourself to be with him. And when you lose your life for him, you find your life. That's the important issue. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Um, are, am I on this one now? Okay, uh, last two, last two, okay, last two. Okay. Uh, my husband physically abused me about a month ago. It was the first time he did that to me, but it was a really traumatic experience for me. I'm still struggling to forgive him until today. Please help me learn to let go and forgive him. Okay. Um, if, you're, if you've dealt with that, um, please get in touch with me. I want to help you. And you need more help than can just be simply said here. Uh, that's a very, very difficult thing, and no man or woman should ever physically abuse their spouse or their children. And for people who are victims of that, that's very, very, very difficult to overcome. However, you can overcome it. 
And the process has to do with forgiveness and healing and, and getting help. And absolutely, I want to help you with that. So I'm not going to answer the question any further than that. Please get in touch with me. Although my wife and I will be gone, we will still be happy to correspond with you. We can talk with you by Skype. And we can put you in touch with other Christian counselors who can help you in that area. Uh, if you are the husband here who about a, year, a month ago beat up your wife, you need to begin to do everything you can to make up for that as well. Asking forgiveness, changing your behavior, learning how to deal with your anger. Very important. Okay, last one. How can I differentiate between my own voice, the selfish part of me, and the voice of God? How do we know that we're going in the right direction? That right there is the best way because it's the selfish part of you. When you're trying to decide between two things that you think God is saying to you, and one of them, it's, it's like deny yourself, follow me, forgive, that's God. And the one that says, no, I don't have to. I, I, th this is just for me. I deserve this. That's yourself. Okay. If you want to test it out, you ask yourself the question, what does the Word of God have to say about this particular issue? So, so you're asking about forgiving one an, another person, and part of you says forgive them, and part of you says don't forgive them. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says forgive them. So the, the voice that you're hearing that says forgive them is the same as, that's the Word of God. And when you do this consistently, I really believe with all my heart that hearing God's direction, hearing God's voice is not that difficult. What happens to a lot of people is they're always telling God to stop telling them things. And then when they have a big decision, they want him to lay everything out for them. God will speak to you. You have to learn to listen. And that's the, the criteria right there is that whole issue of the selfish side or wanting to do what you want as opposed to wanting to do what God says and what the Scripture says.